Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us this morning at this special meeting, this special APRECIT Congress, which is increasingly successful every year. While we were waiting to start, I was looking at the program, and there is no doubt that Kairos has the proper suitable definition that leads us to the most significant and relevant topics. I should thank Appleseed for being bold enough to invite Javier to help us think about and identify ideas and actions related to ethics in agribusiness. As a framework for our discussion, I'd like to say that the so-called Argentinian decadence is a monster with several heads and with several roots as well. We can see those heads every day. You see them in poverty, marginal communities, insecurity, volatility. Now, the issue is, what are the roots of this decadence? And this is something discussed not only by our by the citizens, but also by, by people from abroad who wonder how come that Argentina maintains this decadence in time. And we are experts in explaining why we are doing badly. Some say we don't do well because of the regional or international context. Others say we're doing very badly because our institutions are weak, because justice doesn't work, because we do not have any political parties, and even institutions which are key, such as our currency, has been attacked over the years. Others say that the cause for our decadence or decline are, is our leaders. Our leadership is fragmented and weak in many cases, unfortunately. Others may think that we do not have the right skills and the net capacities, and I mean infrastructure and human skills, lack of resources, especially in hard sciences. I'm living through this situation right now. Another explanation for our decline or decadence is our behaviors, which undoubtedly reflect our beliefs. And everything that this brings about, and we see this every day, the mafia, drug trafficking, everything you're so familiar with. In short, this makes up a long list of explanations that we know, but which are overwhelming and sometimes lead to paralysis. Sometimes we see such a huge and difficult problem, and we believe that there is not too much that can be done. Argentinians, this is what Argentinians are like, and we are a bit decadent. This morning, we're here to tell you that there are alternatives, that things can be different. And I'd like to share with you a quote by many leaders and dreamers in our recent history. 
and I mean Luther King, Gandhi, or locally, an extraordinary person whom you may know, Catalina Hornos. They all say that the bad guys are not so important, are not so much of a concern. What is a concern is the indifference of the good people. In order to close this introduction, I'd like to call upon you, I'd like to call upon this community of farmers who, are, who care about the most valuable, important thing related to our identity. It's a virtuous community. I call upon you to add yet an additional challenge to your agenda, talking, discussing, and hopefully after the discussion, tackling changes and transformations so that ethics will not be just a rhetoric thing. Javier needs no introduction, but Yes, we're going to introduce him anyway. I'm sure you'll do a, a great job. Javier Gonzalez Fraga is an economist with on your diploma from the Catholic University. He has postgraduate studies at the London School of Economics and Harvard University. He's former president of Central Bank of Argentina, 1989, and then 1990 and 1991. In January 2017, President Mauricio Macro appointed him to lead the Argentinian National Bank. He's also founder of Salamandra, and he was a candidate to become president of Argentina by the Unión Cívica Radical Political Party. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. I'd like to thank the APRECID organizing committee for having invited me. Um, I apologize because I'm wearing the banking uniform. I was wearing a tie because I have a meeting. Afterwards, I've taken my tie off to talk to you because I feel I'm a colleague of yours. I've always been an agricultural farmer, an agro-industrial farmer with buffalo mozzarella and dulce de leche have always been close to production. It's my Spanish blood that prevails. And at times, it's also been close to politics. But I'd like to thank Apresid for giving me the opportunity to talk about ethics. You get to Banco Nación. This is one of my passions with the topic of housing, SMEs especially agricultural SME, but ethics is part of my priorities. I'd like to leave my footprint in this administration, and today I'm going to launch Banco Nación as an example of ethics in banking. Let me start by talking about something which I'm sure you're all thinking about. What does ethic mean, being a good person, besides being a farmer, besides working from Monday to Saturdays in production? I will go to mass, to the synagogue, or to wherever on Saturdays. Does it mean that besides my revenues, I should devote part of it to donations, charity, so that I will be respected? Because of that, and my answer is definitely no. Ethics is key to capitalism. Capitalism is a result of Protestant ethics. I apologize if some people may feel offended, but this is the way it is. The founder of capitalism is Ivan Smith. You all know, or Many of us may know that Adam Smith in 1976 published his famous book, Fundamentals of Modern Economy, The Causes of Wealth of Nations. 
and he says quite honestly and surprisingly that we depend on the selfishness of butchers to be well fed. It's a butcher's personal interest what helps us have enough beef at a fair price. What is less known is that 12 years before that, Adam Smith had written the theory of moral feelings, where he said that prior to that, Adam Smith was a Scottish Anglican pastor. And he had said that the basis was ethic behavior. The butcher will not cheat you with scale, will not sell without a receipt, will not slaughter an animal that weighs less than 320 kilos. This is the basics. This is the assumption. This was less known. So this ethics is the essence of modern capitalism. It is not what you do just on Sundays in mass or at the synagogue or when you do charity. No. Ethics should be part of business. Ethics is intrinsic to business because this is the blood of modern capitalism. This is why I'd like to emphasize that capitalism is a result of Protestant ethics. It was not born in other cultures, but in the heart of the Protestant ethics. Going to the financial world, finance makes sense if it's there to support people today and tomorrow, today and in the future. If it's true that it's there today and in the future, then we will start setting or imposing conditions on the financial activity. Why? Because without planet, there's no future. So part of the ethic approach should be caring for the environment, sustainable practice. And here we have to leave finance aside and leave the search for earnings aside. This does not explain what finance is about. If I use one of those financial calculators we all use, and if I do some simple calculations, we will see that for pure finance, when man is left aside, the future is not important. Future, the future is not just two or four years. When we speak of preserving the environment, we mean the environment and the planet for our grandkids in 50 years' time, try and do the following financial exercise. I said this many years ago, and I will repeat it in Rome in a seminar in a few weeks. I've been invited to talk precisely about this, ethics and finance. Try to consider 100 future value in 50 years and try to calculate the present value of those 100 by discounting at a 4% rate, which is a reasonable rate for a financial transaction in 50 years. I'm not going to talk about the 50-year bond, but 4 is a good rate for 50 years. If 100 is the importance of the planet in 50 years' time, forests, rivers, life, the ocean, the current, the present value at a 4% discount is 8. So I only care at an 80% rate. If we talk of the financial aspect only, if the importance exceeds 80%, if that importance exceeds 80%, then it means 
we're attaching more importance to things in the future. But we all want grandchildren who will enjoy forests, rivers, and a sustainable planet. So it means that finance are not reflecting the importance of the future. The discount rate is too high. So we have to leave that financial logic aside when we talk about the future. If you get into Pope Francis' Evangelium Audium, he clearly punishes the economic focus of sustainability because the justification is not economic. We need to find extra economic, extra financial reasons. And this is where the ethic approach comes into play. We cannot leave banking. We cannot approach banking with a financial view exclusively. It may be even profitable to attack our planet because long-term calculations, because, well, I will use an, a crop that causes erosion for like six years, but I don't care because tomorrow's damage or the damage in 10 years at today's value is less important than today's profits. Understanding this is understanding why we cannot leave these activities based on an economic or financial concept. Try to calculate the present value of 100 pesos in 50 years' time. Use any rate, and you will realize why the financial logic cannot solve this problem. We have to take the problem out of the financial and economic people's hands, because they don't have the tools to work this out. We need to include ethic concept, but not as a supplement, not by devoting money to mass or to charity, but by incorporating this into our economic decisions. This is, I think, a key issue. If we start to understand that we have to work for people, but not only today's people, but people of the future, then we will care for our planet and we will pay attention to environmental risks, to structural and social inequities, poverty. Many have already said this. The next war be, will be a war between the rich and the poor. We're seeing this in Europe. Immigrants, nationalism, that's the new gap in the world. And we have to pay attention to it as well, because otherwise we will not see what's actually happening, internal and external migration. I was in Panama a few weeks ago and said, what about this new neighborhood? It's the Venezuelan, the Venezuelans, towers and towers. And when I learned how many people had arrived from Venezuela, it was really surprising. So people move around today. from Eastern Europe to Western Europe. We ourselves receive lots of immigrants, and we have to incorporate this concept. Some people intend to build up walls, but people will jump over those walls. And we also have to pay attention to technological changes, which are quite challenging. I, I've been using a quote for a few months, and I've allow the president of the central bank to use this quote. We all, I mean, Uber will affect all of us. We will all have our own Uber. There is Uber in Dubai already. If you click on the window and the voice will ask you where do you want to go and you're taken there. This is a big challenge. Today, banks are opening up branches, but in two or three years, they will start closing branches because people will no longer want to visit the branches. Everything will be done over the Internet. With the cell phones, we will increasingly do our transactions, and this is a big challenge for many activities. How long will it take until trucks will be driverless? 
The other day, I was reading a NASA report saying that the man who, who's going to live 150 years has been bo born already, and uh, soon enough, 200 years. So if you talk about 40-year mortgages, uh, you know, moving from 30 years to 40-year mortgages, uh, I mean, can you envision um, a retired person in, in 40 years of now? It's not going to be 70-year-old people. It's going to be more than that. That's why the millenniums are so special. They are getting ready not to accumulate, but to work only twice a week. They don't want to have their own car. There's going to be car sharing. There's going to be so many cars out there uh, not being used. Uh, the planet is going to share planet, uh, houses, cars. This is the world that is coming up on us. And we have to be very attentive to that. This is why a financial approach is not enough. And we have to add on the topic of the ethical bank. Uh, this is a concept that was born in Italy a um, couple of decades ago. And it has become a part of the agenda of the UN 2030 agenda um, in connection with sustainable development. And Argentina is going to hold the G20 meeting next uh, year. And I want the Banco Nacion to be um, the standard banner, um, the standard holder in this aspect, uh, because it, it, it has a social and an environmental aspect, not only an economic one. Regarding the economic growth, uh, obviously, there's challenges like the ones that I mentioned. and robotic productivity growth, and this will uh, generate a planet where the rich and the wealthy will fight the poor and everything will, you know, go up in smoke because uh, we need to do something about that before everything is destroyed. This is a challenge that has generated inequities in the last few years. Inequities are growing all over the world, not just in Argentina. In Argentina, when I was born, it was eight to one, rich and poor. And now the, the figure has become even more uneven than 40, 45 years ago. And the same for the world. Um, if you read Piketty, for example, Inequality is growing, is on the growth, and it will go on uh, growing if we don't do something about it. And this has to do with the ease of making money financially uh, rather than productively. And then there's also the issue of social inclusion that I was talking about, the growing uh, differences between rich and poor and also extreme poverty uh, in particular. And this is a topic that is very close to me, how to fight against pro poverty because economic theory says generate employment, but reality says that employment that you, you're generating has too many requirements for the poor to be able to have access to that because they are not skilled enough to have access. And then there's a second uh, response to that question, which is education. Obviously, we have to generate employment and education. Nobody will deny that. But what happens is that there's a smaller sector in Argentina, is like 15 percent, that does not have the capacity to educate their people in the same way. Public and private education creates uh, um, divides, uh, creates gaps. And so there's very few in our among our children that can understand a high school text. When you compare public and private education, that already it makes 
creates differences and not anybody qualifies to go to elementary school. When a one-year-old baby, Mockelberg uh, uh, from Chile promoted this idea for the first time, when a, a baby younger than one year is hungry for 24 hours, that creates um, a problem in his brain. Um, a, a signal in his brain that creates uh, an enemy for himself. And the enemy is himself. He is self-disabled um, to be successful at school, and he will be vulnerable to drugs and to other stuff. What The failure there comes from the family. A part of the population has been exposed to non-functional families. And part of the reason why a family is non-functional is because they are homeless. And uh, there's three words that are related in all languages, from family to home and from home to house. And as uh, Pope Francis has said, without a house, a physical house, there's no family. And it is the family that is the true defense against malnutrition, unwanted pregnancies, uh, abuse, uh, the absence of parents, etc., uh, etc. Et so, and inappropriate house, and it's two and a half million people who don't have a house. Uh, when you sleep um, on a makeshift house and you don't have a place to share meals with your family or a room because he has to share a room with the uncle, uh, etc. And we know what that leads to. And then when he wakes up and leaves that house, he's exposed to other things in, in the community. So when I am the president of Banco Nacion, I see all of this. And we have a common goal with the UN, eliminating poverty for 2030. Of course, I don't argue with the need to create education and to create um, an economic uh, state, a viable state. But we need to work for living facilities, for houses. And that is part of the ethics a bank has to aim to. And then there's a question of the environment. And you all know a lot about that. In Argentina, there's over 2 million hectares that have been flooded recently, and 4 million that may be flooded. And of these, 1 million was supposed to be part of the coming uh, crop so or harvest. And uh, these are things that are essential in a productive scheme. I have just finished reading a book. I was very much impressed by it, uh, written by Harari, an academician of the University of Jerusalem. I'm sure you know Harari is, is also quoted by Duran Barba. From animals to gods, the history of Homo sapiens is Outrageous. It has combated and destroyed um, different species. Australia was not a desert before men uh, peopled uh, Australia. And where does all of this end up? We don't know. The book says we don't know whether we're going to become gods or whether we're all going uh, to go up uh, in, uh, into thin smoke when uh, the planet is destroyed and then man disappears from the planet. Everything has to do with sustainability. So 2030 and sustainable development is a very significant topic that has to call on us to get together. And Banco Nacion cannot be left outside, in the same way as finances cannot be left outside. And what is the role of the bank in this sense? And this is, I'm wrapping up now um, to leave space for questions. We are emphasizing uh, 
the aspect of housing and uh, other undertakings. Uh, somebody asked me outside, why don't we uh, fund uh, these activities instead of a Chinese bank doing so? But the bank is not here to do what everybody else can do. We are here to do what nobody else does uh, to help those who don't qualify to get a loan to give a loan to farmers who don't qualify. Uh, this is the sense of what we do. This is why we have so many micro undertakings. Uh, uh, that's why the issue of living facilities is so important. We're not funding um, country clubs. We're funding uh, living facilities, living quarters for people who don't have them now, uh, who have lost them things that we don't have, but also we are here to look at other things that other banks don't look at. We look at efforts rather than balance sheets. We have a line of credit, a uh, credit line that is called your effort is our best warranty. And if we have uh, a dentist who's just graduated and his education costs 2 million pesos to our national state, and he graduated within a reasonable period of time with reasonable grades, wouldn't you lend him 1 million pesos even if he has no track record in the job market? Uh, the uh, our judoka who won uh, the Olympics in Rio last year, if she wants to um, ask for a million dollars in order to undertake some activity, wouldn't you give it to her? Yes, for whatever she needs, I would give her the money. She doesn't need my money because she's going to become a physician. But anyhow, she's an Olympic champ, uh, a, a person who's used to making an effort all the time. 99% of the people who make efforts, our scientists, for example, our scientists are successful because of what their track record shows and uh, physicians who are residents and they do not have uh, um, an income, a fixed income. Come to us. We are going to give you a loan because we have to go back to that, to trusting, to uh, trusting people's efforts, uh, let us stop thinking of balance sheets or warranties. Let us start trusting people, uh, elderly people like myself, you know, people like myself who come to me and they say, my father uh, bought our um, land holding uh, thanks to a loan given just by signing up for it with Banco Nacion 50 years ago. So we have to go back to that. We have to have branches to help most of our people, not the minority who do not need our loan, for the majority who do need it. And this translates into a in concept, a notion of integrity uh, with a sustainability component in it. And this has to do with risk analysis, with Im financial impact, environmental impacts of funding that we give. That is, we are adding this on to our bank. We're a long way from that, but we are doing it already. And also for housing, for micro uh, undertakings, uh, you know, we were we were helping people who were marginals, and now they have many companies because they prospered. And also, last but not least, the fight against corruption. And I want to be very clear here. Even if it is not, uh, it doesn't sound nice, but we are slaves to what we have written. And I wrote over 20 years ago, wrote a chapter in the book Corruption by Mariano Grondona. I wrote a chapter where I uphold that the most effective way to fight corruption is punish those privates who participate in the corruption cycle. 
it's it's a very economistic way of thinking. There's always a public officer who would be willing, who would be tempted to change a lifestyle and that of his uh, children by doing something that is unlawful, accepting monies that are undue. But yes, it's possible that that would happen, but it's only half the problem because you're feeding a person who is willing to do this. Uh, a private entrepreneur who's willing to do this. In Argentina, we need to go back to dignify the possibility, the likelihood that a public officer who receives a bribe should go to jail. A private that pays a bribe today who would end up in jail, the likelihood of that is one in 1,000 maybe. If we could make this into 2% or 1 in 50, 90% of Argentine corruption would vanish. I wrote that 20 years ago, and I remain a slave to my own words. Um, this is a case that has affected our former vice president. Well, let justice do justice. It is much more important than the private who paid the bribe should go to jail than even the vice president or public officer who accepted that bribe. Because a private entrepreneur visiting a public officer is much more common than for a public officer, a vice president, to do what Boudou did. There's not too many of those. But entrepreneurs who are ready, businessmen who are ready to do that, to pay a bribe, that's where we have to put our energies on. Um, Last Tuesday, I was telling a group of entrepreneurs of the realty business uh, in the province of Cordoba. Uh, they were talking about sugaring up or uh, enabling, in that sense, uh, the payment of a bribe with somebody in Cordoba. If I see that as the president of the Banco Nacion, uh, somebody does that, I personally will take care of that person going to jail, but also the public officer who did that will be in jail. So it's a many-faced uh, notion, corruption, social integration, housing, sustainability of the environment. All of those notions are part of an ethical bank. And this is what Banco Nacion wants for itself, becoming the standard uh, banner of ethical notions in the world of business. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Javier Gonzalez Fraga, for your presentation. We have some time for questions and answers from the audience and from our facilitator. Thank you very much, Javier. Your messages are quite powerful. I'm sure some will generate an endless demand. Loans provided by Banco Nacion will be will multiply. You get lots of loan requests. I know there is only the two of us here, so I will I'd like to interrupt because there are regional managers here that listen to me at the CCK auditorium. And I said this a few months ago. I said it again in June. That is our message. I'd like to quote, in quoting Francis, Pope Francis also said, mess things up. Dare 
trusting people. We have to go back to know your customer thing rather than the balance sheet and income statement. I'm saying if the bookstore around the corner needs a loan and their balance sheet is not so good, but if we see that they pay the rent on time, if we ask the owner for his credit card and we see, hey, you were away on vacations in Europe for two years and you've also been skiing, I'm not the IRA, IRS. I'm just here to give loans to a bookstore. And the president of Central Bank, Federico Sturzenegger, is making things easy for us because he's introducing flexibility. Today, we can provide loans equivalent to eight minimum salaries just by taking down the data of the person's personal ID. If I'm convinced, I will give any person 80,000 pesos in loans and apologize for insisting in this. There's a story I want to share with you. I cannot give you the name of the city because the bank officer will complain about it. But in the southwest of the province of Buenos Aires, the manager called an officer from headquarters and said, because I said that every 10,000 inhabitants, they should provide a loan to at least one micro entrepreneur entrepreneurship problem. He said, hey, I have 30,000 people here, so I have to provide three loans. And what's the problem? Well, there is the butcher. What about the butchers? And sits with butchers. And the butcher wants 50,000 pesos to expand his cooler. And why not? He's a good butcher. But you know what? Everything is registered at his mother-in-law's name. And his farm is registered with his sister's law. Nothing is registered by himself. And I apologize for this weird thing. And, and do you think that the butcher will fuck it up? And the manager said, no, I don't think he will. So I said, well, then give him the loan. We have to trust people. This is much more important than requesting balance sheets. But in order to achieve this, we need to empower managers. And this means a whole revolution inside our bank. I think it is great to go back to this, to go back to the link, to the bond with people who are requesting help. And this means assessing or taking a look at a person's values. While we get questions on the screen, I'd like to ask the following. All of us play different roles in life. We have our private lives, our loved ones, our professional interests. And in your case, we some of us play a public role. And we sometimes face dilemmas which look contradictory. We feel we have the Tupac Amaru effect. Conf Conflict. There is this conflict. What do you think? Is there a private ethics and a public ethic? No, not at all. There is a single ethic. It's values. I think quite highly of politicians. Of course, I know there are exceptions. But in general terms, young politicians who start with a political activity at university, they usually show real concern for others. Some eventually go the wrong way. But I've worked a lot with people from the financial industry. And I'd rather have politicians or farmers who really care. Why are you here in this the atmosphere is different than the one you may see in a banking sector meeting because you produce food and for a million years in humankind's brain it's been marked and registered that producing food is something good. It's one of the oldest activity and consequently one of the most honorable activities. So I 
believe that undoubtedly there is a single ethics that related to survival of humankind and politics, finance, production should all be covered by these ethics. In this very private discussion we're holding, just the two of us, people in the agricultural sector are quite unique. Either they breathe different air or they drink different water or they eat different food, but they, they have a sense of labor, of work, of responsibility, of commitment to nature, to production, to wealth, to thinking beyond the current times. But there's a question people are asking. It's related to our current situation. Society, after our experience over the last few years, society has decided that a change is necessary. Change and transformation usually go hand in hand. But let's assume there are synonyms. What do you think? Do you think that those transformations are actually taking place? And beyond Banco Nación, you're clearly explaining what you're doing, but do you see that this is becoming widely spread? Changes always take time, and they, are all, they can only be measured looking back. Suddenly, you realize you have taken a turn, but you don't see it when you go forward because those detours are quite small, but we are going through a transformation process. Believing that leaders can go faster than society is wrong. I agree with the gradually, gradualism thinking in Argentina because I started arguing with Martinez de Oz chart. You were very young at the time, and 13 years ago, I wrote with no shortcuts, which is going against the gradualism, because shortcuts leave many followers aside, so the political and social cost is too high. So a few months ago, I wrote an article in the National newspaper stating that gradualism is the fastest way, fastest way to a country with social inclusion. The orthodox thinking states that we have to drop public expenditure by one million people, and we have to do things faster. Well, to be brief, I always say this is what Christina wants us to do so that they can come back, because that was their plan. So I definitely believe that this administration has taken the wrong and between path. This is why we're criticized by the right and the left. We have avoided a huge crisis. We're now going out of it almost with no social cost. As Ernesto Sanz said this morning in an interview, analysts are very much involved in the election campaigns, but the social cost was minimum, has been minimum, and it's mostly related to increase in utility bills. We're about to run out of energy, food, dollars. We have been running out of beef, bread. We have been able to avoid a huge crisis with a minimum cost. The cost has been higher for the high, the middle classes than for the low classes. I know profitability has been affected. I am familiar with the difficulties of the middle class, but we have focused on minimi minimizing social costs as we have done every time we have had to overcome a crisis, 1981, 2001, several times. So I believe we are going the right way that prioritizes social and political aspects because if the leaders do not revalidate or convalidate their power every two years, they will fail. The best economic piece of news we may see in the next few years is that we 
succeed in the elections. No other economic news will be so important. If you give me two buttons and you tell me if you press here, deficit will go down by two points and you press this other button and you will succeed in the next elections, I will press the latter because this will help me work for four more years. So I think that lots of things are being done that people may not be aware of, but I was seeing the issue of poverty, structural poverty. That is a great question. If you, if a couple with a, a child make 15,000 pesos, you're not poor for different surveys, according to different surveys. Now, this family, uh, a worker and a housemaid who have two children, they live in slums where streets are not paved, there's no sewage, buses do not go through those slums, there is no ATM closer than two kilometers. Every time they go to the ATM, they can be robbed. When the daughter walks 10 blocks to take the bus, she may be raped. Is that family poor or not? They are. I don't like that definition. If you make 15,000, you're not poor. And people who are included in one category or the other do not even learn about this. So this is theory. I'm inter interested in measuring poverty based on the basic unmet needs. And if you consider this, figures are much worse. Almost half of the Argentinians have some basic needs that are unmet. This is why I support the works that are being done for sewage, paving, 600 kilometers of streets will be paved by the end of this administration. Roads, rural roads, in Tres Arroyos, there will be a new policy to pay these roads. This would be narrow roads, such as the European ones, so as to take protection out. Tear of long-lasting pavement on cement. These changes, in turn, change poverty from a qualitative point of view. Building schools, even if you still make 13,000 pesos in your classified as poor, if you have drinking water, access to ATM, to transportation, to ambulances, then from a qualitative point of view, you are doing better. Eventually, you will get a better job, and you will be able to increase your income. But the structural fight against poverty is what we are focusing on. We have to open up our eyes and understand this. Some months ago, I read some statistics that said that 8 out of 10 inhabitants in Buenos Aires say that some public works are being undertaken in their area. This is what this administration is focused on. Fortunately, we are led by an engineer who is obsessed with these things. Our last president was engineer Juan B. Justo. Most of the roads we have were built by Justo. So it's not a minor thing to be obsessed with public works. And we economists have to be less important while engineers have to become more important. I always say that if economists had been advisors to Roca in 1880, maybe they would have decided that building the railways would not be um, economically feasible. This week, a minister told me that the big surprise for many candidates who are walking the country is what you've just said, the enthusiasm and the presence of public works all over, close to everyone. And the numbers is that they're spending the same in public works as a share of the budget in this budget in this administration than in the previous one. But the big difference lies in corruption. Is that really true? Yes it is. 
in some cases, we have been able to save 30 and even 50 percent. That is, we're building twice as much with the same amount of money. Let me go back to something you've just said. This is what I call the new form, the new types of corruption. Ethics, as you just said, is much more than corruption, is environmental protection, inclusion, recovering dignity, strengthening freedom. But let's talk about corruption because I think this is what society is demanding. And we're talking about the new types of corruption. And one of those types of corruption is what small or medium farmer faces when they have to face bureaucracy. Is that one type of corruption? How do you see this? In a wider sense, it is. It's a hindrance. It's a cultural obstacle. They all protect their small field. Bureaucracy happens because people want to defend their jobs, their positions, and we have to fight that. I have my own fight. I fight my own fight at the bank where there is a specific culture. Three times a day, people tell me this has been done this way for 20 years. And my answer is always, this is no justification. Einstein, I cannot quote him literally, but he said something like, don't expect to change if you keep doing the same things over and over again. So, yes, there's something there. But at the same time, half of what I do every day is create motivation. I trust my people at the bank, my staff, absolutely, and I know that my success and the success of those coming after myself are going to be with my people, not despite my people, um, stimulating, accompanying, having them understand the goals. You know, people who were here in April, we had a meeting um, at a national hall, and um, plus their husbands and wives, and we had everybody there. It was a family event, and we urged them to change the mentality uh, with which they work. They're, they're and we had a neurologist speak to us uh, to urge them to come out of a comfort level because comfort levels are paralyzing or castrating. Um, and we need to add on satisfaction and the honor of belonging with the Banco Nacion uh, because it's also protection for yourselves. Uh, everybody wants to have a son, a brother, a relative work at the Banco Nacion because it's a very prestigious organization. But they need to add to this pleasure. You know, when they go out in the street, you know, they'll find somebody. I saved my business thanks to the bank. I started my um, undertaking thanks to Banco Nacion. And because the Banco Nacion is there to accompany the growth of a company, to grow hand in hand with the country. And it's, it's the, the public banks are important. When this country was amongst the 15 wealthiest nations in the world between 1920 and 1950, the Banco Nacion was half our financial system. And Banco Nacion assets and loans represented 10% of the gross domestic product. 60,000 million dollars. Today is 6,000, so it's 1% that much. We are 10 times smaller in our presence than we used to be. So we need to recover that Banco Nacion of those days to walk along with the the rest of us in Argentina so as to become a member of the world community, to become a beacon in the world, because we have a fate of 
uh, greatness, I think, in, in the world community, in the concert of nations. And we need to do this all together. And together is a word that we hear in the political campaign. Uh, but this is not against anybody. This is really all of us together. And as Banco Nacion, uh, I feel I'm the president of the bank of every single Argentine in our country. <clears throat> We do not have much time left. I have two brief questions. We talk a lot about the Argentine divide, uh, the gap, the what differentiates us, what separates us, divides us. Is ethics something that is part of that divide? No, I think ethics has to do with justice, with the fewest. Those who put their foot into it should pay for what they did. But we need to understand, because a part of the population has voted and still votes for the previous administration. And we should not be uh, angry with this idea. I dislike the jokes that you get over the cell phone. That is not right, because we have to get into somebody else's shoes, into other people's shoes, in the sense of, you know, maybe there's people who do not see beyond the short term, or maybe because they got some money, because whatever they got was not enough for them, um, or because they didn't know that what we were doing with the beef industry uh, was killing cows and, and things like that. But not everybody can understand that. But we have to separate the chaff from the wheat, corrupt people from decent people. And we should not uh, feed or fuel this divide, we have to know that we are all at the service of everybody. The differences are between leaders, not between the people who vote for them. And what would be your suggestion to our people so that each one of them in their own places, in their own jobs, uh, what is that place from where they can help build a better Argentina, more inclusive, more solidarious, more healthy and ethical Argentina. Well, I'm not in a position to give advice to anybody, but I would just say dare do, dare listen somebody else. Don't look for confrontation. Try to listen to others. Try to understand where they stand and that would give more sense to your world and by listening to others you will be changing your own little surroundings your own little world because a 1000 kilometer trip always starts with the first step and taking the first step makes you a better person. And you don't need advice. The people who are sitting here today, I'm sure, already are clear uh, about this. And that's why they are here. And that's why they are so well satisfied with producing food, because it's so, um, I mean, part of, uh, it's so human nature. and. Uh, Nobody, somebody who works uh, with cows ever came to me to ask, should I um, try to reproduce my, my cow or, or not? And uh, I mean, nobody asks that because it's a noble activity and, and, and close to producing food and uh, comes making houses uh, because we were nomads before we became sedentary and before architects and builders. But getting food for, for, for us is the most important task we've ever done as mankind. Um, hopefully, um, I really wish this, uh, expect this has been useful to you, maybe a notion you've heard or things that will take some time to identify. Maybe we have started you thinking and on my um, 
own behalf and also on behalf of Apresid, I'm, I'm very glad to be here talking about this. Uh, to be here talking about business and ethics. And uh, I thank you for being here, for your patience, uh, and, no, and thanks to Javier. And Javier says, I am thankful and grateful to have been uh, honored to speak to you here.